of his mind. Cannon, I love it. Like you were just out there shredding and now you're here ready to worship. From worship to worship, that's how we do it. Mm. I know, it's really, it's a fun, there's some fun ways today and it's, unfor- it's getting better unfortunately from what I can see, but, <laughs> uh, but we got some great worship this morning. Um, Bill's gonna bring us a word. We have an exciting dedication today and, uh, and we're just, by we I mean me, but I think all of us are grateful to um, feel the sun on our faces, the sand on our toes, and uh, to know the creator of this incredible expanse. So let me, let me uh, just say some words of prayer, and then we're going to worship. We're just going to sing songs and uh, exalt the name that is above all names. So Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the waves and the chance to enjoy your creation. Thank you for this location. And um, thank you more than any of that, that for whatever reason, you called us to be your co-laborers. You've you've invited us into stewardship of this earth Hmm. and into, Lord, bringing your order and reign and love and thriving and flourishing as your spirit leads us. So we just lean into that this morning and we thank you and we worship you Hmm. because you are worth it. You are so worth it. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Rachel's going to lead us in some worship through music. Yes. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. So we have the freedom to worship in this space, in a beautiful place, as well as we get to sing our hearts out loud. We get to spend time with God in this place freely. So let us not take that for granted. Let us be intentional about our worship this morning, singing out loud the praises of our God and worshiping him not just with our voices, but with our hearts, our minds, our entire being. Amen. Let's sing together. Come all you weary Come all you weary Come all you thirsty Come to the well That never runs dry Drink of the water Come and thirst no more And come all you sinners Come find his mercy Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved, for God so loved the world that he gave us. His one and only son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. And bring all your fears, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his Of 
beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Jesus, nothing compares to your name Nothing compares to you. So we praise you in this place with our entire being, with our breath that you have so freely given us, Lord. Help us to acknowledge your presence in this place and praise you. So we sing, it's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the dark. Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord, and it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath.
you are great to us. <clears throat> you give us the breath to praise you, Lord. You give us the space and the freedom to praise you. And God, we thank you. We thank you that we get to come together as a family and worship you and sit with you and learn from you, God. So help us to open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us this morning. Let's we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Rachel, for leading us in worship through music. Good morning. It's great to be snuggled up with you on this rather warm day. And um, I want to first welcome anyone, if it's your first time or your first time in a long time. We're so thankful that uh, you're sharing this space with us. And um, whether a four, a four-footed friend or a, uh, a hominid, we are happy you're here. I want to um, just highlight a couple wonderful things. Uh, first of all, we're the River Church. A church going, God knows where to do God knows what, right? Is that right? <laughs> That's our new thing. <laughs> no, it's not, but I'm just going to keep saying it until people think it is. <laughs> but we really are a family, and you're part of it this morning. And so thanks for joining us. Um, we're a church that likes to worship and exalt. Uh, we're built as humans. We believe with all of our hearts we're built to worship. And you see that just as an anthropologist studying human beings. We all tend to want to worship, and that whether it's the right things or the wrong things. And as a community, we say, let's worship um, that or the one uh, we were designed to worship. And we actually have an opportunity this Thursday night, if I'm not mistaken, Thursday night, yes, uh, October 27th. And it's going to start at uh, 7 p.m., 25 Strawberry Lane. Information on the World Wide Web, our website here at the River Church of the South Bay. Uh, but it's going to be just an opportunity. It's very organic. It's just some prayer time, some worship time, and I just want to encourage you wherever you're at on the worship spectrum, whether you're new at it and you're like, what is this thing? Or you've been doing it for a long time. We just want to invite everyone that wants to be a part of it to come on out. Um, and where is like, there's some great people on our team, by the way. Uh, so one of our pastors, Brooke Andrews, one of our pastors, Brooke Andrews, just had her third child, little, little baby boy named Crew, C-R-E. E W crew and he's so cute and so awesome. And so, um, yeah, we're just celebrating and thanking the Lord for this new life. Uh, and, and Tom Denise, they're on sabbatical right now, a much deserved sabbatical, but they still hang out with us sometimes, which is a good sign when your pastor's on sabbatical and they're not like, yeah, I'm not going back to church, but they're here. So if you see them, you know, email, um, uh, uh, not Bill. Uh, let's say email email me, and I probably won't read it, but email me if you have any issues that you want to deal with. <laughs> and I'll get back to you at some point in the spring uh, when, when things open up. So, but, but we're just so thankful. We're so excited for you guys being grandparents yet again. So what a, what a one. Yeah, what a wonderful thing. We love you guys. Speaking of love, where's Taylor at? Taylor, get up here, Taylor. Skip on up here. <laughs> Speaking of love, that's how I introduced Taylor. Look at this guy. What a what a wonderful, hardworking, great leader. Just yeah, we're always into physical. Con we just do this kind of we'll stuff. Masters, yeah. But, but <laughs> we're just doing our own thing, people. We're just doing our own thing. We forget you're here. Um, no, I, I want to hand the mic over to something cool that's happening uh, at the River Church. Yeah. Thanks, James. Um, so, hi, my name's Taylor. Uh, if I haven't got a chance to meet you yet, I'm one of the team members here. Um, we're in this series in the book of Acts, and one of the things we're learning in Acts, kind of the central theme we're seeing, is that God is continuing the mission of Jesus through the people of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit here in the South Bay. And um, we have all kinds of ways we do that as a church, both on an individual level, each of us. Uh, we don't just gather as a church, we scatter as the church and live as the church in our own individual callings. But we do some things uh, to, to collectively own that mission together. One of the things that I'm really excited about that uh, we did last spring and we're doing now again here in the fall is something called Alpha, where we just create this space uh, over at Hennessy's in the Riviera. There's a back room where uh, we uh, 
create a, an environment, a conversation for people that wouldn't normally attend church or are just checking out Christianity and exploring, are either not followers of Jesus yet or on the fence and trying to figure out what they believe, um, to just give a, a really great conversational space for folks in that, in that camp. And uh, one, of the, one of the coolest kind of examples of this, uh, the last time we did this, um, we're we're uh, at a couple different tables, just enjoying some food and some drinks and having conversations about Jesus. And uh, one of one of the guys that was with us, uh, a guy who's not yet a follower of Jesus, but um, he was sharing with us a little bit of his personal story and some real significant personal barriers that he's had to faith in Jesus, which is, is his story to share. So I won't I won't share the details, but um, some he was sharing with us some really deep personal hurts that he's experienced from people who have claimed to follow Jesus. And uh, as he was telling this, he paused and he just said, you know what, I've been so interested in Christianity for a long time, and this is the first space I've had where I felt like I could really dig into these issues, I could talk about Jesus, and not feel like I was going to be judged. And I just, you know, we, we thanked him for saying that, and um, it wasn't anything we did other than just create a space. But the beauty of that story is that's exactly why we do Alpha. We create Alpha as a space for people who wouldn't normally talk about Jesus to have a great experience talking about Jesus. And uh, many of you received a flyer on the way in. We're doing it right now. Uh, it's at Mondays at 6.30, uh, from 6.30 to 8 here at Hennessy's. And I want to really invite uh, us as a church family to consider who, we might, uh, who God might have put in our lives who could really benefit from a space like that. Maybe it's some of us. Some of us here gathered on the church and we're like, uh, here's the church. And we're like, you know what? I've been checking this out for a while, but um, I don't really know exactly what I believe. Alpha is a great place to do it. Um, if you have a friend in your life, I'd really, I'd really like to invite you to consider what it might look like to take a step of faith, to invite them to come to Alpha or to begin praying for them uh, and to think about what another step of faith might be for, for you to, to, to take with them. Um, because good things happen when we say yes to taking steps of faith for Jesus, uh, especially when we do so in a way that m uh, matches the character and the heart of Jesus. So um, if you could let us know that you're coming, it's very helpful. You can let me know here after the service, just flag me, grab me. Uh, uh, and tell me. Uh, also, there's information on the website in the little RSVP section um, in the connect section of riversouthbay.org. If you can let me know by like tomorrow around lunch, that's really helpful. But also, if you just want to show up, that's totally fine too. We, we plan for that. So um, it is helpful to let us know that you're coming. Uh, so please do. But if you just at the last minute decide, you know what, I'm coming, or I hear from a friend who wants to come, I'm going with him, please, uh, please drop on by. But good things happen when we say yes to getting in on the mission of Jesus. And I want us to raise our imagination of what, what that could look like as a church. So um, please pray with us. And uh, I'm excited to see what God continues to do. James, you. speaking of love. You, <laughs> speaking of love. Oh, man. So exciting. Thanks so much, Taylor. Well, I want to, uh, we do something as a church family from time to time, when there are little babies in this world that are being raised um, just by parents that say, we want to follow Jesus and we want our, our child to be raised in that environment. Uh, and so I want to invite up uh, Luke, the hardest work, Luke and Brittany, Luke and Brittany, the hardest working couple in youth ministry uh, right here. Yeah, some incredible, incredible too. And they're going to lead us and tell you more about it. Awesome. Thanks, James. We have just one of the most adorable babies that's going to be dedicated this morning. And I and Brittany are just so excited to be here in this moment. So we're going to have the Phelps family come on up. Little baby Magnolia. Oh, I'm just so thankful well, for this family, but um, for the lighting here because the sun is just going to shine perfectly on Maggie's face, and you all get to see just how adorable she is. She's so cute. And we have Tim's parents here with us today. That's Tim and Karen Phelps. I know, Tim, that's where you get your good looks from. We can tell that much. Oh, it's so sweet. Uh, so Brittany and I have known Tim and Brianna for, for a couple years now. Uh, we Met them at the Norris, if that dates us, um, so about two years ago. Uh, and we've been with them and have walked with them through the pregnancy and, and now through the almost first year of Magnolia's life. And one of the moments that really stands out to me about uh, who they are as people and as parents is 
I think it was three weeks after Magnolia was born, they were here on the beach, ready to go. And the best part is that they were all dressed amazing. They were put together. It didn't look like the first few weeks of pregnant, or not pregnant life, of, of little newborn life really got to them. They were just kind of rolling with it, happy faces, and Magnolia was just all dressed up in this cute little onesie with Magnolias all over it. And it was just so special to watch. And that's really been how you have, have parented. It's just you've rolled with it and you have made faith a central aspect of that too. So uh, it's an honor to be here and to be asked by you to, to do this moment together. Uh, as you may know, baby dedication it has its heart and its root uh, in what's called the Shema. Uh, it is a passage of scripture in Deuteronomy uh, and I want to read it for us today, where it really sets this principle of, of how we are supposed to raise our children. So here it is, it's Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. This passage of scripture says that you are going to love the Lord your God with all of that you are, and that you are going to teach that love to Magnolia as she grows, and to do so diligently. That you're going to see this love, and she's going to see this love in you, and the way that you love each other, and the way that you love the Lord in every single aspect of your lives. So I'm going to ask you a few questions here, just uh, as you are committing yourselves to raising her in the faith. So the first, do you receive, oh, and uh, you probably know this because you're married, but you're going to respond with the we do's. Okay, thanks, yeah. You, you've gone through this before, but do you receive this child with gratitude as God's gift to you and your family? We do. We do. Awesome. That's the right answer. Do you commit to be parents of personal faith, recognizing your children are more likely to follow God's path by the model they first observe in you? We do. Two for two. Do you commit to lead a faith-filled home that honors God in all your relationships and in the choices you make in spiritually growing your family? We do. Last question. Do you commit to be parents with patience, recognizing that with your inherent strengths and weaknesses, your desire to shape your child is a loving act that will require time, lots and lots of prayer, and all God's work in order to produce in your children what he and you hope for. We do. Oh, four for four. Yeah. This commitment that you are making to raise Magnolia to be a person of faith doesn't happen alone, though. It happens in a faith-filled community. So I'm going to ask you all a question, and you all have probably been to weddings, so you know what to do here, is you're going to respond with, we will. So we recognize that a child is not raised alone, but in a community. It takes a village to truly raise an individual in the faith. So community, river community, will you be there to support and encourage the Phelps family to help raise Magnolia, to support, to encourage, and most of all, to pray for them as they go through all the wonderful joys and hardships of parenting we will. we will thanks thanks james that was the response i was looking for out of everyone yeah good and you have wonderful family that's going to be there for you two of them are standing beside you here uh and Brittany and i Four of them. Yeah, you guys. oh yeah yeah and Brittany and i will be be there for you guys too um yeah, we were just so honored. So what we want to do now is, is pray for a little Magnolia. Um, so I'm going to come over and ask you to come in the middle, and Brittany and I. Yeah, we'll surround you. There it is. Family, do you want to come in too? All right. Would you join me with praying for Magnolia? Father, we recognize that Magnolia is a gift, a gift to Tim and Brianna, a gift from you, a miracle. And we are just so thankful for that. And of all the many blessings of this life, this feels often as the most special one. 
And so Tim and Brianna here are saying that they want to give Magnolia back to you and entrusting her walk and journey in life to be in your hands. We submit their parenting to you as they seek to raise her in a faith-filled environment to teach them the ways of your word and how to live according to the ways and words of Jesus. So, Father, we dedicate Magnolia to you. Ask that your hand would always be on her, that your spirit would be inside of her, that she would come to know and love you all the days of her life. And we ask for your blessing over Tim and Brianna, for all the fruits of the Spirit to be filled in them as they seek to parent her well. And we pray for us as a community that we would be people that will live truly into that covenant community, that support, encourage, love, and pray for this family. So Father, Magnolia is yours, fully and completely. So we give her and ourselves all to you. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Phelps. You can take a seat. Yeah, isn't she just adorable? She's so cute. Timmy, you got to give us a hug now, too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. How, how wonderful. What a heartwarming, heartwarming and important thing. Well, we, we normally stand up and say hello, but um, we wanted to make space for this dedication. And so instead of the normal stand up and wander around and say hello for five or more minutes, we're just going to just say kind of where you're, where, you're, where you're sitting. If you need to stand and stretch, that's good too. Just say maybe wave to someone or, you know, give like a, a smile to a neighbor. And uh, while Bill comes up here to uh, set up shop for bringing that, the word of God to us on this lovely morning. So Bill, come on up here and say, say hi to each other. Just, you know, a little, a little low, low, uh, low key high. <laughs> Bill, you, re you ready? You need a microphone stand or are you gonna no, hand help? Just, That's just... what I'm talking about. It is going, no doubt. Love it. It's just, it's almost perfect weather right now. Like the, oh. and the waves are getting so much better. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> I'm watching this inside right, no one's on. And I'm like, look at this, this just keeps coming. James, I won't coming. judge you. You just get your board and go out there. <laughs> no, just I, stay off camera. <laughs> just stay off camera. No way, I want to hear this way more than that. I'm serious. No joke. All right, folks. Well, I'm going to pray for Bill and uh, kind of dedicate our hearts and, and minds to this time of learning, reflection, being open, open to hear what um, we may need to hear and reflect on what we need to reflect on. So let me pray for you, Bill. Lord, thanks so much for this morning. Thank you for my brother, Bill. Speak uh, this morning in, in your word. We are hungry hearts. Lord, even if we are so hungry and thirsty in our hearts that we can't even sense it anymore, we need so very much your life and your truth. There are so many lies that attack us in our hearts and minds. That Some lies we tell ourselves, some lies that are told by our culture, some lies that the enemy hurls at us. There are just so many of them. That God, we need truth. We need to hold it like an anchor in a storm sometimes. Lord, and we need also your refreshment. So, so Lord, let this next space of time be that refreshment. We love you. Thank you for Bill and his preparation, heart, and experience. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, James. Good morning, everyone. Really delightful to be with you. Have you ever had one of those experiences, or maybe it's a journey, it's a turning point in your life, where the way you saw the world was completely turned upside down? Like from this point on, you experienced the world totally different than you did before. For me, one of my earliest memories of having a paradigm shift, having my lenses challenged, was when I was pretty young and I had no sensitivity to uh, dropping trash on the ground. Do you remember those days when you were small and you didn't have this understanding that trash is supposed to go in a trash can? And I'll be honest with you, 
I can remember one time driving in a car with my parents and I had fast food trash in my car and I literally thought, oh, I can easily get rid of this by just picking it up and stealthily putting my hand out the car window and dropping it on the road as we drove by because then it would be gone. Can you believe I did that? I know. Well, if you've been on any middle school or high school campus lately, you know that that change of paradigm doesn't usually happen until sometime in high school or college. But I can remember that moment when the light turned on for me. And I thought, wait a minute. If I drop my trash on the ground, it will get swept into a sewer and end up in the ocean. And when that realization hit me, my world changed. And now, to the best of my ability, I will fight that horrible shame when a gum wrapper drops out of my hand and blows away in the wind. I have to go get it. So we're going to look at a paradigm shift. Uh, this PSA, by the way, was brought to you by Heal the Bay. Thank you very much. And we're going to look at a paradigm shift that happened in the book of Acts. And you know, as Taylor said, in this series and exploring the book of Acts, we're continuing to see how God is continuing his mission through Jesus, through his people, us, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to invite you to go to Acts 10. I'm going to not, I'm not going to read the passage because the story is in the whole chapter of Acts chapter 10. It may be familiar to you, but I'm going to tell the story. If you want, you can have Acts 10 open and you can follow along in the story. But I want you to see the process that the Holy Spirit leads Peter through in learning, wait, I can't drop trash on the ground, or at least his understanding of what trash actually was. So this story in Acts 10 is an interchange between a man named Cornelius and Peter. Now, Cornelius lived in Caesarea. Caesarea was on the coast. It was an incredibly beautiful site where Herod had gone down and built a giant uh, harbor. He had a palace there. What king doesn't want to live by the beach? And he'd leave Jerusalem, go down to the, to the palace by the beach. And Cornelius was a military commander uh, in Caesarea. Now, you have to understand that this guy as a military commander in the most powerful nation in the world, which used their military machine to crush any opposition. And at a heartbeat notice, they would execute, they would harass, they would imprison. And Cornelius, though, at the same time, the story tells us, was devout. And he actually became a god fear. A god fear is a technical term for that Gentile person who sees the Jewish faith and their monotheistic allegiance to one God. They're really attracted to it. And so, though he wasn't a Jew, he was seeking and he was sensitive to what was happening through the Jewish people and wanted to be like them. And so, he prayed often and he gave lots of gifts uh, to the Jewish people. He was an unusual person. And one day he had this very definite vision of a shining angel that came in front of him and said, Cornelius, your prayers and your gifts have gone up to God. Now, this is what I want you to do, Cornelius. I want you to go about 35 miles south to the little village of Joppa. And there, go get a man named Peter, who's staying at the house of Simon the tanner in Joppa. Now, the story shifts to Peter. The very next day, while Cornelius had sent some soldiers and servants down to Joppa to get Peter, Peter goes up on the roof to pray. And he's hungry. And then he falls into a trance. So maybe he was, you know, a hunger trance, as you've sometimes experienced that. And in his trance, Peter sees this large sheet coming down out of the sky. And in that large sheet are a, t a bunch of animals, like four-footed animals and reptiles and birds. And 
really the sheet contained what Peter considered a bunch of clean animals that he could eat, but a bunch of yucky, dirty animals like there is no way I'm going to eat that. It's horrible. And in this trance, he hears a voice that says, get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Now, for those of you that are vegetarians and are quite animal sensitive, this may shock you that God was telling Peter to go get an animal and kill it and eat it. Uh, I imagine the Durrells and Jerry with the zoo were extremely uh, dissatisfied. That's a reference if uh, any of you have watched it. Thank you very much, Carrie and Larry. Get up and eat. And then Peter replies, surely not, Lord. There's no way. I have never, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice comes again from God. Peter, do not call anything impure or unclean that God has made clean. Now, the voice said this three times. Right, just for your devotional pleasure, maybe think back to another time when the voice of God through Jesus had to tell Peter three times to go do something. So just then the men from Cornelius arrive and the spirit tells Peter, go downstairs because there's some men that are here and they're looking for you. Peter goes down, he greets them. Here's their story, and then he decides, okay, based on what just happened, I'm going with these men back up to Caesarea, and he brought some fellow believers from Joppa with him. Now he's at Cornelius' home up in Caesarea, and he walks with Cornelius inside and discovers there's a rather large gathering of people, Gentiles. And this is how Peter greets them, okay? Talk of like sensitivity to the moment with the crowd that he's with. This is what Peter says. Hey, um, everyone, just so you're well aware, you know it's against our law for a Jew like me to associate with or visit a Gentile like you. <laughs> Not exactly the warmest of greetings. You know, like it's my cultural understanding. It's my religious, spiritual duty that I don't interface with you. I don't visit, I don't touch, I don't even hang out with you at all. I, I won't even go inside the house of a Gentile that invites me. But here I am. So Cornelius, what, why did you invite me here? Cornelius recounts the vision that he had that the angel told him, go get Peter and invite him to come to your house so you can listen to everything that he tells you. And Cornelius says to Peter, all of us are here, and we are listening. Talk about a softball pitch for a pastor or anyone who wants to share their faith with a crowd of people. We're listening. We're all ears, Peter. We want to hear. Something is going on here. And so Peter talks. Peter shares from his heart. Peter is now sharing from a heart where his lens on life, his paradigm for understanding himself as a Jew in relationship to the Gentiles has been shattered. And so he begins to talk about Jesus. He's Lord of all. He explains Jesus' ministry. And again, we talked about this in a prior message about the message of the gospel and the way that Peter and Paul and others articulated the gospel. It always included the fact that Jesus was Lord of all, that God had made him Lord of all. Talked about his ministry of healing and his good deeds. And then it goes to the cross. And Jesus was put on the cross. And three days later, he rose again from the dead. He's going to be the judge of the living and the dead. And then Peter ends by saying this in chapter 10, verse 43, all the prophets grounded in his sacred scriptures testify about Jesus, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness through his name. You see what Peter said? That everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness through his name. Peter is now having this brand new awareness. 
wait a minute, this was in our scriptures all along. Peter's paradigm is turning upside down. Now, while he's still speaking, the story goes on. While Peter was mid-sermon, the Holy Spirit descended on all of those Gentiles, overwhelmed them with his presence and power. They began to speak in other languages, speaking in tongues, filled with the Holy Spirit, just like what happened in Acts chapter 2. You remember when Brooke was up here talking about the day of Pentecost? And the Holy Spirit descended on the Jews, and they all began to speak in other languages so that the whole crowd could understand what they were saying about the good news in Jesus. And now it's happened again. Not just for the Jews, but now it's landed on the Gentiles. And in verse 47, he says, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized. This was unthinkable to Peter and the other Jews. Peter's paradigm used to be the lens with which he looked at the world is there are clearly walls between me and those people. And the Holy Spirit came in and shattered the wall. He tore the wall down. Peter now understood that the good news is for everyone, everywhere. If Peter hadn't have got that, we wouldn't be sitting here. The good news is for everyone, everywhere. Peter's mind is blown as now his understanding of Jesus has become extremely expansive. So that brings me to the trajectory of Acts. A major theme, it's a thread, if you will, that goes through the whole book. It's, it's really part of Luke's primary purpose, or should I say the Holy Spirit's purpose to help us understand where Acts is going. And I, I've, read, I've read through the book of Acts uh, many times, but specifically in the last couple of weeks, I've just read through the book of Acts to say, what's the movement? What, what's important? Where is it going? The movement in the book of Acts, if you read it for yourself from beginning all the way through the 28 chapters, the movement of the book of Acts is from Jerusalem always out, always out, embracing more people in more diverse places with the good news of Jesus. It's as if you put a dot and that's Jerusalem. And in the book of Acts, you can begin to draw concentric circles around Jerusalem and those circles keep getting further and further and further out. And the book of Acts will actually end in Rome, which was the epicenter of everyone's understanding of the world and power and sophistication and intelligence. So let me just give you a, just a, a quick sort of um, touch point on some of this movement out. It all starts with Acts 1.8. In the first chapter, Jesus said to those early 12, those disciples, you will, be, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem and then in all Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. That's the vision. And then chapter 2, we have Pentecost, right? And maybe Pentecost is a, re a reversal of the Tower of Babel where, you know, how the, the, the languages were, were, um, were scattered and so people couldn't talk and understand one another. And in Pentecost, everybody understood the good news. And then in chapter 3, verse 25, Peter's speaking to the Jews and he reminds them, and you are heirs of the prophets and the covenant God made with your father. And he said to Abraham, God said to Abraham, and this is so key, way back in Genesis, the very beginning of the story, through your offspring, Abraham, all peoples on earth will be blessed. The, the Jews were told, I'm choosing you to bless everyone else. Now, by the time Peter saw that sheet coming down with those ugly, dirty animals, th that vision had been lost and encrusted over. We're the chosen people, and the rest of the people are ugly and dirty, and I don't want anything to do with them. 
But it was there all along. It was there from the very beginning of the story. I'm going to bless you so that I can bless everyone else. In chapter 8, there's persecution and the believers are scattered down into Samaria. Out of Jerusalem into Samaria. And they're taking the message of Jesus with them. And later in that chapter, Philip has this this encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch. And that eunuch takes the gospel back to Ethiopia. Chapter 9, you'll read the story of the conversion of Saul. And Ananias was with Saul, and the spirit told him, and Ananias didn't want anything to do with Paul, because Paul was killing uh, Christians. He said, go, go see him. This man... Paul is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to what? To the Gentiles. That was Paul's mission. The gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. Chapter 11. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Next verse, verse 20. Some of them, however men from Cyprus and Cyrene, they went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And then you remember last week, Luke talking to us about these believers in Antioch. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them, So after they'd fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off, Barnabas and Saul. And the rest of the story in the book of Acts from chapter 11 to 28 is recounting the gospel going further out, particularly by the movement of the Holy Spirit through the life of Paul who had been called to take the gospel, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And his passion was to plant churches further out among more diverse people in more diverse places. It's the trajectory of the Holy Spirit. It's his passion to help people be captured by the love of Jesus, the good news of salvation and life that is eternal now. So let's fast forward 2,000 years to, to right now, to our cultural moment. And I want to be sensitive uh, in, in my observations and honest as well um, and just yield comments to the Holy Spirit. In many ways, I think today we're facing the pressure to do the opposite of the Holy Spirit trajectory of out. In many ways, I feel it. In many ways, it's easier to pull closer in. to begin to um, embrace our people. Fearing or even disliking diversity. And I use that in the widest sense of the world word. Fearing what's different. And for a couple decades, Christians have been prone to, out of fear, to circle the wagons. M- maybe against against culture yeah, and I'm, I'm 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 hopeful i'm thinking taylor and and uh and and luke in the next few weeks we'll talk about paul in athens which is just a beautiful picture of paul's perspective on how christians can relate to culture not afraid but trusting in the power of the good news of jesus russell moore called this uh an arc mentality. In other words, in the context of our culture and our pressures and the things that are happening around us, there's this, there's a sort of subtle temptation to get back in the ark and just ride out the storm. Like, you know, it's too scary and dangerous and bad out there. So let's just get in the ark and pull it, pull it in. And You've seen it. You felt it. There, there's more and more kind of an us versus them mentality. And in fact, it seems like people have more enemies now. Like 
the other is the enemy. You're the enemy. If, if, we, if we think differently, we see differently. Now, I'm, I'm saying this against the backdrop of the trajectory of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. I, I'm not really making a, a cultural commentary because I don't think I'm smart enough to do that. But, but what I am trying to do is I'm trying to take seriously what's happening in Acts and what the movement of the Holy Spirit has been. And then the pressures that you and I feel. I like comfortable and cozy. And the river, for sure. We are a very comfortable and cozy church. I mean, it's, this is a wonderful thing. Now, I'm not making a critique on the river church, okay? Please. Please understand me. <laughs> and remember, if you send emails, they go to James. So why, why, why is this happening? I, I mean, I think all of us, if we had a discussion, which I hope you do in your grounded group this week, if we had a discussion, we'd bring up the pandemic, right? Did the pandemic just like, whoa, this has rocked our relationships and our, the lenses by which we see the world. And, you know, I mean, certainly the pandemic. And then sort of the political discourse that has happened during that time, it's just, it's made us a bit brittle and a bit sensitive, and, and for some, not you of course, but some quite trigger happy, you know, to where this us versus them has been ex exacerbated. And of course, you know, you have to throw in the role of social media in, in the midst of all of this. And I'm, I'm not a, a Luddite, I am not an anti, you know, computer. I love social media. I think it's fantastic. I love seeing pictures of your babies. Well, sort of. Um, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear in the adult population, and my friends, it's created incredible anxiety in the younger generations. It's just, it's the world in which we live in today. And then I think there's just a little bit of ambivalence about the future. Now, what I mean by that is, can I really influence the war in Ukraine? Like, what do I do about that? Like, what, what's, what's my power to um, bring about world change? So... I can tend to get kind of ambivalent and just see what's happening out there and just say, you know, well, okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll take care of my, my stuff. So here I, I have a question is I'm, I'm kind of, I'm bringing this down. I, I hope I'm not bringing you down. I'm bringing the sermon down. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it back up. The question is, for me, the question is, who is discipling us? The reality is we're always being discipled. Dallas Willard used to uh, love saying, who is shaping you? Who's forming you? Who is forming you, your heart, your mind, and your thoughts? This is another way of saying what, what are the lenses that you're wearing to look at the world and interpret the world through. And I, I want to suggest that as followers of Jesus, we're always driven back into the sacred scriptures as a foundational place. Who is forming you? You're, you're, we are being formed every day. And I want to suggest that it's possible without us even recognizing it, that there are some narratives that we pay attention to that are shaping us profoundly. And they're not necessarily the narrative of Scripture or the movement of the Holy Spirit to love and to embrace the person that is next to us with the love of Jesus. What is the, the lens? Is it... Is it the algorithms of the internet and friends? We have to take the algorithms very seriously 
because to a great extent, our relationship with social media is not our choosing what we want to see. It is very, very adept in choosing for us. And the internet loves it. I'm only saying that to sort of prick your mind to pay attention to who, what is shaping us. Is it cable news? Is it our favorite podcasts? And I'm serious. I have been self-reflecting and asking the question, where, where, do these, where do these promptings inside of me come from? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it the stuff I'm reading? Peter was very reluctant at first. He said, God, no way. No way. I have my understanding of what it means to be a spiritual, faithful, obedient Jew and now follower of Jesus. This is the way I operate. This is the way I see through the world. And the Holy Spirit had to bump him three times. Hey, dude, I, I want you to understand. I'm calling him clean. Don't call anything unclean that I have decided to call clean. Now, <clears throat> he was first blind, but I'm so grateful that Peter had a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. He stepped back. He reflected. And he said, wait a minute. The, the Spirit is pushing me in a brand new direction. And again, I say brand new direction that was in the sacred text the whole time. It was the movement of the Spirit from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And this is one aspect of it. Jesus will be Lord, starting in Jerusalem and in circles farther and farther until one day he'll return. And Paul says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. We get the incredible privilege of being part of that movement, part of that story of inviting more and more people, whether it's tomorrow night at Alpha with Taylor at Hennessy's or our neighbor or the person that literally kind of just keeps bugging us. I'm going to finish with uh, a very silly story. Um, because in Ephesians 2, Paul tells us that Christ, when he came, he broke the dividing wall between um, the Jews and Gentiles. He broke it down. I was speaking at a, uh, at a college conference, and um, Cynthia who became my wife, was there. We were single at the time. And I'm speaking at this conference, and I'm teaching through the book of Ephesians. And I get to Ephesians chapter 2, and after teaching on the fact that, that, that the Jews and Gentiles were in conflict with one another, but when Christ came, he broke the, the dividing wall, making it possible for Jews and Gentiles to be in one family together, to love one another. And I, I ended the talk by saying, hey, I, I'm going to give you a 30-minute discipline of silence. And I want you to go out, and I want you to pray. I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit. I want you to ask the question, is there a dividing wall between you and any other person? And if so, ask God what you can do about it. And I said, that person might even be here this weekend at the camp. And so I sent them all out for a 30-minute time of silence. They left the lodge. They went scattered all over the camp, sitting on a log. Cynthia is praying. And in her heart, she says, there is a wall between me and Bill, the speaker. Now, I'll be honest. This is why it's silly. We were getting to know one another. There had been a bit of flirting going on at the camp. We'd known each other a long time. There were sparks beginning to pop up here and there. And she tells her best friend, Kristen, she says, Kristen, the, the wall that I'm feeling is between me and Bill. I'm 
Okay, this is silly. I'm not the hero of the story, okay? I'm attracted to him. And I can't listen to what he's saying and take notes and, and listen to God because I'm, I keep thinking about him and our relationship. There's a wall dividing us. Kristen said, listen, this is what you need to do. You need to go back to the lodge. And if you walk through that big door at the lodge and you see Bill, you need to go tell him. And you need to break that wall down. Oh, that was brave of this girl to do this. She walked up to the lodge and she opened the door and I was standing right there in the doorway. And she took a big gulp and she said, hey, can we go over out here on this bench and talk? And there she confessed her sin of loving me. <laughs> and then we got married and we lived happily ever after. There's so much more to that story. But here's, here's why I tell a silly story. Because she was brave. And she was able to face what was happening. My question for us, you know, rather than talking about geopolitics and the next election and the pandemic and, and the war in Ukraine, maybe I can just make it really simple. Is there a wall between you and another person? It's as simple as that. What would the Holy Spirit have you do? The love of Jesus wants to embrace more and more and more people. And if we as a community could just ask that question every day, is there a wall between me and another person that, that, that I have some sort of agency in reconciling or taking the next step or breaking that wall down? It might be a friend, a family member, but it might be someone that's culturally different than you, has different preferences than you, and Christ always comes in and he tears the wall down. There's no wall that the good news of Jesus can't break down. I'm going to ask Rachel if you come up here. We're going to worship together. And then Luke's going to come up and lead us into communion. May the trajectory of the Holy Spirit continue to have free reign and you and I, as the good news of Jesus, wants to embrace more and more people in more and more diverse places. What might that look like for you this coming week? Amen, amen. Why don't we stand together as we close off our time in worship? pointing our hearts towards communion. And God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision. To see things like you do God, I look to you You're where my help comes from Give me wisdom You know just what to do God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me vision to see things like you do, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, give me wisdom. You know just what to do And I will love you, Lord, my strength 
and I will love you, Lord, my shield, and I will love you, Lord, my rock, forever, all my days, I will love you, God. Sing hallelujah, and hallelujah. I took um, two things away from your message. Uh, the first is that we are all disciples, all the time. We are shaped by the things around us. And the second was what you ended on, that what walls need to be broken down between us and someone else around us. And then I'm thinking about the table and how that does seem like the culmination of these two things. What better narrative to be shaped by than the narrative of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection? And what better person to be thinking about and what better life history event that breaks down walls than the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? At the table, we are shaped profoundly by the grace of Jesus Christ. And so I invite us all this morning to participate in the table with that in mind. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. In a similar manner, he took the cup, the wine, and gave it to each of his disciples. As it was passed around, he said, this is my blood that is shed for you, the blood of the new covenant. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. So brothers and sisters, I invite you now as we close this service to take and reflect on the radical grace that was given for us in the body and blood of Jesus. And as we close, church, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to go and live this out. So go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, living as the people of God, doing the mission of God, powered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.